Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Andrew Redman. I'm the director of the Mexico Institute here at the Wilson Center. And it is my great pleasure to welcome Licenciada Socio Galvez Ruiz, presidential candidate for the Fuerza y Corazón por México Coalition to Washington and to the Wilson Center. And I do that on behalf also of the Atlantic Council's Adrian Arsh Latin America Center, the Brookings Institution, the Center for Strategic and International Studies, the Inter-American Dialogue, the International Republican Institute, the Migration Policy Institute, and the U.S.-Mexico Foundation. Every 12 years, the presidential election cycles in Mexico and the United States coincide, and this 2024 is one of those years. Our election, of course, in the States is already grabbing attention, but the Mexican election is also of great interest here in Washington, and that's evidenced by the large number of think tanks with whom we were able to partner for this event, as well as members of the private sector, academia, and civil society. Mexico's elections will be the largest and perhaps the most consequential in its democratic history. The presidential election will likely result in the election of Mexico's first female president, something we've not yet accomplished here in the United States. But it's more than simply an election that may be historic for reasons of gender. <laughs> this is an election to determine Mexico's future path. The next president will take office at a time of great challenges, inequality, violence, impunity, climate change, and geopolitical instability, among others, and also great potential for nearshoring, for strengthening of North America, for developing collaborative strategies to address common threats like supply chain resilience and pandemics. The two main candidates for president in Mexico have very different perspectives on the role of the state, civil society, and private enterprise. And as a result, they offer contrasting visions on how to respond to and capitalize on the challenges and opportunities that the next president will face upon assuming office on October 1st. Recognizing the challenges and opportunities posed by energy, migration, nearshoring, security, USMCA, and water, the Mexico Institute released a short compilation of policy recommendations for ne Mexico's next president. It'll be my pleasure in just a moment to share a copy of that report with Licenciada Galvez Ruiz. We hope, as I said, when we launched the report in November of last year, that the new president and her advisors will find the framing of the challenges and opportunities that she or he will face to be helpful and that they'll consider the recommendations. We describe the book as a point of departure that urges the candidates, the parties, and voters to consider what needs to be done to address those challenges and capitalize on the opportunities that will contribute to Mexico's economic and social development in the next sexenio and beyond. The report was printed in English, but it's available online in English and in Spanish. In addition to the issues addressed in our book, there are myriad others that we did not address including uh, the fact that Mexico's new president will need to manage Mexico's diplomatic relationship with the United States. There's virtually no policy issue facing either country that cannot be addressed more effectively and successfully if our two nations work together. We are important trading partners, and with Canada, not only do we have the USMCA, but we'll also jointly host the 2026 World Cup. And this will offer our presidents and our societies an opportunity to demonstrate to friends, allies, competitors, and our enemies the dynamism and competitiveness of North America. This morning we have the opportunity to hear directly from Licenciada Galvez about her vision for Mexico and her plans to address many of the challenges and opportunities I mentioned, among many others. I want to note that we have extended a similar invitation to Claudia Sheinbaum and to Jorge Alvarez Maynes to visit Washington as have all the think tanks with whom we partnered this morning, and we truly hope that they will accept that invitation. Just a couple of quick housekeeping items to share. Translation is available for this morning's program um, in the auditorium with translation devices. Online, the live transmission is being broadcast in English, but a Spanish recording will be uploaded as soon as possible, and then both recordings will remain on our website. Following Licenciada Galvez Ruiz's remarks, our Wilson Center Global Fellow and great friend to Mexico, and to many of us here this morning, Diana Negroponte, will moderate a question and answer session. If you're called on to ask a question, we would ask you to try to keep it brief so that we can ask as many as possible. Uh, our moderator, Diana Negroponte, lived in Mexico from 1989 to 1992, 
and had the opportunity to travel to each of Mexico's 32 states with her husband, Ambassador John Negroponte. She was at the same time working on NAFTA's dispute resolution chapter and building homes in city slums with Habitat for Humanity. As a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, Diana edited The End of Nostalgia, Mexico Confronts the Challenges of Global Competition, and published numerous articles and videos about developments in Mexico. She's a member of the board of El Museo de Arte Popular, and as I mentioned, a global fellow with our Global Europe program here at the Wilson Center. I'm now honored to introduce Xochitl Galvez Ruiz, presidential candidate of the Farsi Corazon por Mexico Coalition. Licenciada Galvez's life story is truly one of rags to riches. The daughter of an indigenous father and a mixed race mother, she grew up in poverty, selling tamales in the streets in the state of Hidalgo to support her family. Moving to Mexico City at the age of 16, she earned a scholarship to study computer engineering at UNAM. Following her graduation, she worked as an engineer and data analyst for several major companies and for INEGI, Mexico's National Statistics Agency. In 1992, she founded High Tech Services, a company focused on advancing high tech initiatives, specializing in the creation of cutting edge projects, architectural design, security solutions, and telecommunications. She subsequently founded and assumed the role of general director at Operación y Mantenimiento a Edificios Inteligentes, a company dedicated to the upkeep of intelligent infrastructure. During the administration of Pre President Vicente Fox, Licenciada Galvez served as head of the Office for the Development of Indigenous Peoples. She then established and became the first director of what is now known as the Institute of Indigenous People. In 2015, she was elected head of government of the Miguel Hidalgo District of Mexico City, a position she held until 2018 when she entered the Mexican Senate as a member of the PAN. She remained in the Senate until taking a leave of absence to run for president. A more detailed version of her incredible story of in individual determination and success is available here in the auditorium and online at our Elections Guide website, mexicoelections.wilsoncenter.org. And with that, Licenciada Galvez Ruiz, bienvenido al Wilson Center. Okay. Muchas gracias. Mexico is not prepared because far from moving forward, my country is moving backwards. I am here to clearly state today that governance and democracy in Mexico are at stake. The lack of legal certainty hinders trust and progress. 
In the last few years, Mexicans have seen our democracy erode. Organized crime and the government of President López Obrador are both a threat to democracy. For decades now, Mexico has been facing crime and violence, but what we see today is something completely different. Organized crime has taken hold of our territory and economy in manners never seen before. The power and influence gained by criminal organizations has become a scourge for millions of people. Just imagine for a moment that you were a truck driver and you can't get from Dallas to Detroit because there are gangs controlling interstate highways. They could mob and kill your drivers to steal your goods. And then those goods are traded in the black market with the complacency of the authorities. Just picture you are an orange grower in Florida and you have to pay a monthly fee to criminals so you can export them. Just picture for a moment that to open a restaurant in DC, you need to pay protection money or piso to the local mafia who also force you to sell drugs on your premises. Well, that's what's happening in Mexico, but you already knew that. So what I would like to do is add a few data to these scenarios to show you the size of a problem. According to Science Magazine, organized crime is the fifth largest employer in Mexico. In 2021, Glenn Banghurt, uh, commander of the U.S. Northern Command, stated that organized crime controls one-third of the Mexican territory. According to the Mexican Statistics Bureau, INEGI, Homicide is the first cause of death among people between the ages of 15 and 35. This process has been hastened and worsened to unprecedented levels under President López Obrador. Civil security agencies have been dismantled and local police forces have been abandoned and the National Guard created under his administration has simply not delivered. He has also meddled with the essence of the armed forces by assigning them to tasks that distract them from their main homeland security function. More than an anti-crime strategy, his campaign slogan, hugs, not shots, has become criminal negligence because the hugs have been for the criminals and it is the citizens who have taken the bullets. The Mexican government simply gave up in the quest for people's security. In the best of cases, López Obrador is feeble and incompetent in the face of crime. In the worst of cases, he takes advantage of this to consolidate his power. This is why he has weakened the electoral authority and has attacked the judiciary time and again. I am going to, I, I would like to ask you to imagine this could happen in broad light in DC. In a protest uh, that took place at the door, uh, doorstep of the Supreme Court of Justice in May last year, a Mexican state government of the President's party brought two real-sized coffins, and inside them were mannequins with the faces of two Supreme Court justices, one of them of the Chief Justice. And you know what was the reason for, the, for this grotesque protest? Well, it happens to be that the justices whose faces were inside the coffins there to, to rule that a bill submitted by the president and supported by his party was unconstitutional. The bill intended to override the autonomy of the electoral institutions. 
for President López Obrador, a vote against his proposals by a Supreme Court justice means treason. Lately, he has threatened, threatened with amending the Constitution to unseat all justices of the Supreme Court, which would imply the end of independence of the judiciary in Mexico and the obliteration of the only surviving counterbalance to his power. In other cases, such as the energy sector, the rules of the game were illegally changed, forcing companies to engage in litigation or to negotiate political favors in what is a perfect example of crony capitalism. López Obrador has also attacked, threatened, and put pressure on journalists and the media like no other president before him. Today, Mexico is undergoing an electoral process with the dies completely loaded in favor of the president's candidate. She has all the resources and government programs at her avail to try to win over the votes of the poorest of Mexicans. Despite its campaign promises, this government has done nothing but foster crony capitalism. The two flagship projects of this administration have cost three times more than originally budgeted, all due to corruption. Recent journalistic investigations have proven that the president's sons have benefited from influence trafficking. Corruption is scandalous, even for Mexican standards. Dear friends, I am well aware that I am describing this situation at a time when you are also undergoing dire circumstances. This great country has its own challenges. For the United States, the relationship with Mexico has been curtailed to two main issues, immigration and fentanyl trafficking. Such a limited agenda reveals a huge shortage of imagination and ambition. Remembering the great scholar Robert Pastor, I must say that our relationship is much more diverse, rich, and positive. We have an enormous potential. However, I have to be very clear about this. Should Morena remain in power, issues like immigration, fentanyl, or any other bilateral issue for that matter, will find no long-term solutions. Solving the immigration and fentanyl issues requires three things that the current Mexican government does not have. A state strategy, institutional capacity, and true and authentic will to collaborate. The president's candidate only promises and offers continuity and she claims that Mexico has never been better. But there is no state strategy. López Obrador sees immigration as a means to blackmail the American government and sees fentanyl as a problem pertaining only to the American people. There is no institutional capacity. López Obrador has destroyed and debilitated civil and military intelligence and security, but he is, uh, does not hesitate to use them to persecute his opponents and critical journalists. The cartels that control drugs and human trafficking will continue to spread. There is no will to collaborate with the United States. López Obrador's populist and nationalistic vision has only one priority, to maintain the United States as far apart as possible so that he can keep on concentrating power. He will pretend to cooperate, but he will not. Today, our countries are partners, but not allies. 
In September 2023, a very offensive event occurred that humiliated the Mexican people. In the midst of the Ukrainian invasion, Russian soldiers took part in our Independence Day parade in Mexico City's main square. Another enraging action against those of us who love freedom was that in 2021, President López Obrador invited the Cuban dictator José Díaz Canel as the main speaker at our Independence Day ceremony. It is in the interest of millions of Mexicans that the United States becomes our geopolitical ally, more than a partner. One must speak inconvenient truths to friends. For many decades, most Mexicans perceived the strength of the United States as the greatest threat to the sovereignty of our country as an independent nation. But today, the greatest threat to the sovereignty and governance of Mexico is the power and influence of organized crime. Only a few years ago, criminal bands used small dirt roads and thoroughfares. Today, they control the main highways of our country that are the backbone for the movements of goods in North America. Super Bowl will be this Sunday, right? Well, you need to be aware that the guacamole you will most likely eat was made with avocados from Michoacan that probably were exported only after having paid protection money to criminals. So in this scenario, I would like to propose four things. One, a straight sta uh, state strategy. Immigration and fentanyl are a shared problem, and shared problems cannot be solved in isolation or unilaterally. Two, institutional capacity. It will be indispensable to rebuild the institutions in Mexico to deal with current challenges. Third, an authentic will to rebuild and regain trust with a broad and diverse bilateral agenda that will help address our issues like partners and allies without double standards or attempts to blackmail. Four, to find solutions to our problems, we need to think out of the box. Because we have a shared destiny. We are now facing new threats to the sovereignty of our nations and challenges in public health and security. The fate of millions of families compels us to act boldly and responsibly to create, negotiate, and carry out deeper agreements that will strengthen our regional security. Due to our electoral law restrictions, I cannot make specific public policy proposals, but I but I, what I can do is listen to the Mexicans who live on both sides of the border. Experts have spoken to me about the need to create a North American customs agency with a highly trained by national staff, certified by both countries with a double mandate. To one, to stop the import of precursors of fentanyl from Asia uh, through Mexico and to stop uh, gun running or arms trafficking from the United States into Mexico. As for combating climate change and forest protection, young environmentalists have proposed creating a North American Climate Emergency Agency. For three administrations now, Mexico 
has unsuccessfully sought to create an anti-crime strategy that will help us regain peace and calm for our people. We are sick and tired of violence and living with fear. Only a few days ago, a friend from the United States, right away from, from Washington, talked to me about the pain his ill children endured from having attended the funerals of five of their very dear friends from college, all of whom died of an overdose. As I have told you before, uh, homicide is the first cause of death among young people between the ages of 15 and 35 in Mexico. The death of Mexican and American youth brings profound pain and horror to our communities. We cannot face unprecedented challenges with conventional responses and conventional institutions. Saving the lives of innocent fellow citizens and regaining peace and calm for our peoples is the best way to defend our sovereignty of both our nations. We cannot continue to define sovereignty with the 19th century criteria in the light of the threats and challenges of the 21st century. Let mutual trust and respect between our two countries guide us in creating institutions and cooperation strategies that the circumstances call for. I would like to conclude by presenting two scenarios for the future of Mexico and the United States. In the first scenario, Mexico gets back on the democratic track to consolidate the rule of law. And it confronts organized crime head on and reclaims its territory. It also reduces violence and eliminates extortion and provides basic legal certainty to businesses. In this scenario, Mexico and the U.S. build a relationship that brings about not only prosperity, but also security, safety, and democratic stability to North America. In the second scenario, Mexico continues to move toward democratic erosion. Organized crime spreads and the military gains political power and is incapable of providing security. Mexicans are victims of insecurity, extortion, and violence, which hinders growth and development in entire regions. Mexico continues to be a trade partner, but not a, ge a geopolitical ally of the United States. Mexico's populist government flirts with Russia and China and threatens to build new partnerships. What I want to say is that in our June 2 election, not only the presidential seat and the legislature are at stake, the constitutional order itself and two contrasting visions of our country are also at stake. The election, of course, is a matter that pertains exclusively to the people of Mexico, but under the current circumstances, it is indispensable that the democratic forces of the whole world become observers of our electoral process. And this is why I ask you to remain abreast and to stand by us during this very difficult period until the election in June, too. I ask you to please um, follow Mexican affairs and support our civil society organizations and democratic institutions. Please do not leave democracy in Mexico off the bilateral agenda. Do not think even for a split second that the interests of the United States in immigration, security, trade, or other agendas will be advanced if we go back to authoritarianism in Mexico. Please do not let democracy be lost. As President Joe Biden has stated, and I quote, 
In the face of the sustained and alarming challenge to democracy and universal human rights around the world, more than ever, democracy needs champions. President Biden, you have to walk the talk. Let your actions speak louder than your words. Let us work together so that Mexico becomes a strong, sovereign and developed country and a trusted friend and partner of the United States. Thank you. The majority of your viewers today are online and they have not got translation. So I shall speak for the first question slowly before I go to the audience and identify people who will ask you about your plans for the future. But first, you are a mystery. You are a woman of indigenous, poor upbringing, and yet you are dressed as a businesswoman. Show us your witchil. Show us your beautiful blouse. Muéstranos su blusa de México. Y ahora ayúdenos a, ayúdenos a entender este misterio de origen pobre indígena y de mujer empresarial y poderosa. <laughs> or, origins, but a powerful well, businesswoman. Well, thank you. Everyone, I would like to thank, I was so excited, Andrew Rudman, uh, our host from the Wilson Center and all the, to all the think tanks that have helped organize this event, and Diana, I know that you are familiar with Mexico as you're familiar with the palm of your hand. I was born 60 years ago in the state of Hidalgo. And if someone had asked me 60 years ago, uh, or 10 years ago when I was 50 years old, what would I be when I grew up? I most certainly wouldn't have been able to answer the question because I didn't know if I would even be able to go to high school, much less complete high school. Going to university was unthinkable because women in my hometown did not go to school. Women in my hometown were victims of poverty and violence, just like my mother. I didn't even think that I could become the mayor of one of the most important districts of Mexico City, or that I could become an entrepreneur or an engineer. When I lived in Hidalgo, the only thing I wanted was to get my mother out of poverty and out of violence. So that was my dream. I left for Mexico City when I was 17 years old, and everyone told me that I was not going to be able to make it that I was not going to make it. They, they keep on saying that to me, you know. But anyway, I was a um, telephone operator at that time and I made $125 a, a month. I, it, it was, things were, things were really bad. I had many academic or deficiencies in mathematics and chemistry and physics. And I was almost, um, I almost dropped out of school because I had to be at the university at four and uh, I studied until 10 p.m. I had to work at, at, from 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. By the time I got home in uh, to in a slum in Mexico City, I was uh, it was 11.30 at night and I, they almost raped me once and I was... Uh, I was just in the brink of going back to my hometown. But then I had this strength push me because I, I thought that the, the sheer thought of not being able to pull my 
mom out of poverty kept me going. So I resorted to, to my friends. They helped me um, improve in mathematics and physics and everything I needed to do. And then I got a scholarship and I ended up having a job that paid me $2,500 a month. And that changed my life. Education changed my world and I was able to eat the whole world. So I set up a company and I set up a, funda a foundation to help malnourished indigenous children. I joined the presidential cabinet. I carried out unprecedented work in favor of the indigenous peoples of Mexico. And so here I am. I am here as a woman who aspires to be the next president of Mexico. And um, I don't want the poor to remain poor. I want the poor to thrive out of poverty. Sile, the president of the Migration Policy Institute and a longtime friend of Mexico, and his daughters are half Mexican, thanks to their mother, to give the first question. <laughs> Can someone bring Andrew the microphone? Thank you. Muchas gracias, Senadora. Um, es un gusto verla aquí en Washington, uh, y su historia es, es impresionante. It is uh, a pleasure can... to see you in Washington, and your story is amazing. I wanted to ask you about migration. What does Mexico want from migration? I know that many times migration is something that is a an exchange token with Washington, but what do Mexicans want in terms of the relationship that we have with our nationals in the United States, many of whom seek to see what our relationship will, we, will be with the Mexican state? What does Mexico want with Central American migrants and from elsewhere that stay in Mexico, a country where they now find a labor market? And also in terms of migration regulation and transit, obviously the border with the United States is part of this topic, but migration in, in itself is very complex in Mexico. What is your perspective? Well, thank you very much. I would like to start by saying something that could be um, uncomfortable or sound uncomfortable, but I, I see migrants or Mexicans living abroad as our 33rd state because they are sending $66 billion in remittances per year. And that is crazy. It is unbelievable to see how they love their families back in Mexico. And we need to just love them with the same intensity as they love their families back in Mexico. I don't think immigration is a problem, but it is a, but rather as a great opportunity for both Mexico and the United States. Today, immigration is now um, an, an issue as well. There is a huge uh, rage against migrants. And I think that this is a time where we must reappraise and come to value what migrants do in the United States. They do the, 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 the work no one wants uh, to do. The Hispanic community is very... Um, powerful economically they, they contribute a lot and I think that what happens to migrants is more or less the same that happens with indigenous peoples in Mexico you know the, the, they are discriminated against and my uh, indigenous peoples live where the gold and silver reserves are where the water reserves are and they are just not valued enough migrants see the same fate as indigenous peoples I spoke to migrants in High Point Market in, in New York, and many of them have been worked, working there for years, and they are still undocumented. So we need to figure out that problem before. We need to know who works where, who does what, and then the United States could analyze the possibility of uh, regularizing them. If I had to sit down with Biden or Trump to, and, and, and negotiate, I would not accept being a third safe country if no fairer treatment 
was given to migrants who are already here. So, okay, and we let's say that if I assume a role for Mexico, then what I, I am I going to get? What are the migrants who are already here going to get in exchange? Because, you know, migrants who are awaiting their humanitarian visa in Mexico see their human rights violated. They are on the streets. They are in parks. Forty of them died in a detention center in Mexico. That is shameful. Then we would need to talk about the southern border of Mexico because some uh, human trafficking gangs have established in Mexico and they certainly have contacts in this side of the border because they are charging $12,000 for each passing of an undocumented person. And I, I think that m migrants also bring an opportunity with them because if, if nearshoring comes to pass, then, then we will have a shortage of, of a shortage of labor in in Mexico. Haitians and Central Americans could be employed in Mexico. There are areas in like in the farm and so or in the industry where we will have labor shortages, and these people could be trained and used there. So let's find opportunities where we see problems. I'm not going to call on all three, but I am going to call on Ambassador Roberta Layou, Mexican Ambassador to Bolivia, to Cuba, to Spain, to ask a question. Muchas gracias. Es una gran oportunidad de escuchar tu punto de vista, Xochitl, sobre las relaciones México-Estados Unidos. Estamos, como bien lo dijiste, en un punto de inflexión, en donde las relaciones pueden deteriorarse por el conflicto que estamos viendo. We are at inflection point where well, thank you, Roberta, very much uh, for your question. I am very glad to see you again. I have known Roberta for a long time now. Well, I would like to start by saying that I have two geopolitical compasses. I have one compass that has to do with my values, and my values are not... Uh, establishing a, a partnership with authoritarian governments and full respect for human rights. And my other compass is reality. You know, I am an engineer and I know how to read maps. And it is clear for me that we share a more than 2,000 mile long borderline with the United States. We have 43 border crossing points and 83% of our trade happens with the United States and more than 80% of tourists who visit Mexico come from North America. So that is how reality strikes. And we need to come to agreements. We need to work together. And certainly in Mexico, my opponents will say that I am here to put uh, my country off for sale and that I just came here to um, reach agreements with the United States. But the reality is that the arms that are trafficked into Mexico are killing youth in Mexico. And the fentanyl that comes into the U.S. is killing young people in the U.S. And um, I am a mother of, of two young persons, and I can stand in the shoes of the people who are losing their young children to, to crime. So let's stop um, playing games and, and simulating. You know, President uh, pretends that he's uh, cooperating and collaborating be by being a third safe country. And, and, and the United States seems to be comfortable because we seem to be solving a problem that they have. But the truth is that fentanyl keeps uh, keeps going into the United States. And this is why we I, I'm uh, proposing this, because we, we need to look after each other. 
so we do stop complaining about fentanyl and arms trafficking. So we can use this opportunity so that you can talk to a woman who is honest, who will not tell you tales, and uh, who will work hard. As an engineer, I follow principles. What is what works stays. What doesn't what what works more uh, or, or have works will be uh, arranged, and what doesn't work will go to ask the next question, but it's going to be followed by Exxon Mobil's strong representative here in Washington. Leela, you go first. Senadora, qué gusto tenerla aquí en el Wilson Center. Es un privilegio que esté aquí con nosotros. Senator, it's a privilege to have you here. I wanted to ask you, we are at a historical moment in history, not only because we're about to go through the most significant elections ever, but both candidates are women. What is your agenda, your perspective for half of the population of Mexico, women, when it what comes to when what is it about femicides? 10, 11 women die every day. I would love to know what your perspective is for Mexico should you win the election. I will remind you that I cannot uh, give you my platform, but I will give you uh, my opinion of what is happening with women. For starters, I am a woman who is victim of brutal violence in indigenous communities. Uh, traditional traditions are, uh, are violate humans uh, or women's uh, rights, but that can be changed with education and financial independence. We need women to have financial independence so that they can make their own decisions and women have asked me to do things as a as a senator and i have undertaken that responsibility we need to set up a national um, care system they need to be supported with, with a daycare center support for uh, those women who have children with disabilities support so that women can provide good care to the elderly. My parents lived in my house for 10 years while they were sick, and I was responsible for looking after them. That is common culture in Mexico, and I was fortunately able to afford a, a, a nurse, but there are people who, who can't, and, we, and women are usually the ones who undertake caregiving to older adults. So women need to have spare time and not be fully responsible for all household chores. Secondly, we need to strengthen education. As a mayor, we uh, we, we provided scholarships, 100% uh, scholarships to women who wanted to go back to university. So we need to support those women who dropped out of university or who want to have like a technical career. And we need to provide funding for um, and women entrepreneurs. So once that women are financially empowered, they are less susceptible of falling victims to violence. But if they are victims of violence, they, we need to set up um, financial support um, network and Women who have been murdered uh, uh, or victims of, fem of femicide did show signals that they were in endangered and we did not pay attention. So whenever uh, the authorities get a call from a woman, they, they, they should not be thought of as just another call for emergency, but they should be taken as a call that needs to be heeded with a gender perspective. Men should know that there will be consequences if they harm a woman. And then, and another thing is that women should be involved in every space of power. Well, if half of my cabinet will be women, half of my cabinet will be men, although I think that maybe women would sort out things better, but I, I will have 50% women, 50% men, but de la indispensable from of women. And that is what I would go for. A gentleman with his hand up at the back of the auditorium, Cecilia. Muchas gracias, y muchas gracias, senadora. 
Y eh, yo quería thank preguntarle, you, you, usted empezó Senator. su discurso. I wanted to ask you, you began your speech speaking of the importance of energy, especially to take advantage of the opportunities of nearshoring. What do you plan to do within your administration, not only for Mexico, because the last time Mexico reformed its energy sector was 11 years ago, and the world has changed. It has moved forward so much, not only in terms of traditional energies, but also in terms of energy transition. What would be your plan should you win the election? I have Un eh, ambientalista de de veras, no de closet, porque la de enfrente dice que... A true environmentalist. You know, my, my opponent says or claims to be an environmentalist, but she was in Congress to defend f fossil fuels. Oh, Ms. Sheinbaum, well, I'm going to tell you a story about my ch childhood. You know, I did not know anything about garbage until I came to Mexico City because we only had two things that we considered uh, garbage. It was like a ba bag of soap and a can of chlorine, but we had no waste at all. We, we composted everything, we recycled things. And I was very... Uh, I, I am very, very um, affected and impressed by the amount of waste that we create. And this is why, as an engineer, I decided to engage in waste management and in water management. And one of my companies is basically devoted to environmental management. As a senator, I have been working on energy, environment, and water. And I am fully convinced that the future of um, energy is electrical power and the future of electrical power comes from renewable energy. So that is my own personal stance. And we are going to get there if we build a strong uh, grid and we will transition, not overnight, but we will have to transition. And Mexico was doing well. Mexico has everything uh, on its at its avail for renewable energies. Mexico has a huge uh, amount of, of sun for solar energy, and we have very long beaches for uh, wind power. And we have a huge potential for renewables, which is the future of energy. So I agree with the uh, reform that uh, was passed in Mexico, and I defended it in, uh, in, in the Senate. And in fact, The day the counter reform was approved was one of the saddest days of my life because I was thinking that we were ca canceling uh, a cleaner future for our children. And climate change is, is a reality. Acapulco had never seen a hurricane like the one that, uh, that, that struck in, in October and the um, and wildland Um, fires. The, the, the planet is telling us something is wrong. And this is why I am a promoter of uh, clean energies. And I think that I am co well conscious of the uh, transition with fossil fuels. But oil is so valuable that we could use it elsewhere. I, I think it's stupid just to burn it for energy. So I think that renewable energies will bring costs down, and I think that the businesses uh, need to have uh, more affordable energy, as do the households. It is not only the businesses who should have aspire to having affordable energy, also the households. And the auctions were the perfect mechanism to attain that goal. So we need to go back to that. So I do not care who generates affordable energy. If the Mexican utility does, they can sell it. If the private sector does, they can sell it. So the goal is that everyone has affordable and clean energy. From Morgan Stanley is in the auditorium or is online? 
Muchas gracias, Diego Marroquín. Diego Marroquín, uh, the Brookings Institution. Diego Marroquín, My question is, the Brookings ¿en español Institute. o en inglés? Como quieras. En español, creo que va a ser más rápido. Es muy puntual. La elección. It's a very specific question. Our elections are in June. Well, the most probably the pan the agriculture panel will make a decision in September between Mexico and the United States. My question is, as president, what would be your position facing a decision from a panel uh, of this nature? Also con considering the phrase, it takes two to tango, over 400 days have gone by before uh, as after the United States lost a panel when it comes to the automotive industry, we're not only partners, you're saying that we also want to be allies. What would you tell your ally if um, words aren't being kept when it comes to the USMCA? It's something, the reason for which we are main partners. Y los acuerdos que se firman se deben de cumplir. Y una de mis preocupaciones... honored. And one of my concerns with energy is that we are just violating the USMCA because the electrical counter reform from Mexico just privileges monopolistic practices. Today, we are um, in an automotive panel that is has not been um, accepted by, by, by the US. And we ha are in a panel on energy that we would very probably Lose. And there is a problem between Canada and the United States on dairy. So it would seem that we all have conflicts with each other. And this is why the agreement will be revised in two more years. So Ildefonso Guajardo, who was one of the negotiators, is part of my team and he's with me today. And this is why the agreement needs to be revised. I think that we need to establish a, a deeper level of, of discussion. Today, we don't have it with Mexico. So the energy issue has been sorted out with crony capitalism instead of with good agreement. So if you are close enough to the president, you will see your problem sorted out. But if you don't, if you don't have a relationship, then your problem is not sorted out and that should be changed. So my position is one that is of ethics, of honoring the, our commitments and to look at each other as partners and that is what we are going to do when we revise Thank the you. agreement. Buenos días, senadora, y gusto conocerla. And good Soy morning, Dolia Esteves, senator, it's a pleasure. Famosísima Dolia, Dolia Esteves, very famous Dolia. I wanted to ask you a question. Um, you mentioned that you urged the in the United States or, or the people who hear you surely in the administration that they should not leave democracy, Mexican democracy of the bilateral agenda behind. Uh, can you tell us what that uh, means? What do you expect the Mexican government to do at a moment where there's this perception that um, it's a state election, at least that's what uh, they're trying to do, that the National Electoral Institute is not the autonomous and strong institution that we used to have. What can the United States do? <laughs> bueno, esa es la pregunta. Gracias. A ver, Dolia. Thank you. That well, was my question. Dolia, you just made a very quick summary of what is going on in our country. Our democracy is eroded. Our democratic institutions are eroded. So what I would propose is that we have international observers so that institutions like this one and other uh, and NGOs to, to see and observe what is happening in Mexico and the Congress also. I, I'll be at, at, at Congress tomorrow please look at what is happening in Mexico. And I'm going to say this loud and clear. That fact that organized crime is so decisively involved in the election is not only a threat for Mexico, but also for the United States. And that is reality in Mexico. There are areas in Mexico where the, we will not install voting booths because 
the, the organized crime is meddled in has meddled in in the election. Some candidates have been um, killed, and the, the the media should analyze a, a normalcy or a mediatic normalcy. You know, the president has become the head of the campaign for his candidate. So the media should give equal and fair coverage to, to the candidates. And I would also ask observers to, to watch over the election. So don't only think of fentanyl and immigration as our agenda, but democracy as well. Can I provide a follow-up to Dolia's question? Um, you have met with Luis Almagro from the OAS. What's your well, purpose with I will talk to the, the OAS? OAS What's that purpose for that? Uh, observers in the election. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Senator. I'm Daliana Stevens from the Inter-American Dialogue. Your position is very clear in terms of energy, renewables, etc. My question is, once uh, you have won the um, election, considering the composition of the Senate and the lower chamber, how will you harness political support, not only to go uh, back to the 2013 reform, but go even further in terms of the energy transition? And if you allow me once uh, in the presidency, what will you do with these insignia projects? What will you do with the Mayan train that damages biodiversity or the refineries? Fortunately, the court has uh, ruled that the reforms are unconstitutional. One of the things that opposition uh, legislature and, and opposition senators did was to prevent a qualified majority from uh, overriding the constitution. So that this means that the reform will go back to being what it was back in 2013. So with that, it means that there will be energy auctions and the government will be able to buy in a, uh, inexpensive or more affordable energy. So fossil fuel uh, energy dispatches were privileged above uh, renewables and now things went back to being what uh, it was before and we don't need to change anything. And in the light of energy shortages, we must welcome the participation of the private sector. So the Mexican utility or CFE will continue to be part of the system, but not uh, in a privileged position because uh, until now it, it was privileged above the other companies. And the other question was about the Maya train. Well, I am not a fan, you know, I am not a, a fan. I, I I am in pain for what happened with the uh, cenotes or the, the, the sinkholes and perhaps the, the, the transistmic part from Progreso to Yucatan to Campeche, that was okay. But uh, section five is, is, an, is a huge mistake. Then we need to check the environmental impact. We need to run an environmental impact study, which was not done. We, we need to make it work because it, it's already been there. It, money has been spent, the, the, the environment has been damaged. So we just need to, to do it properly and uh, do it right. As I have said before, whatever works, works like the social programs and they will stay, social programs will stay. What doesn't work uh, goes and what can be fixed, we can fix. Uh, the, the, the president said that it would have been better to buy another Deer Park refinery. Uh, I, we will have to revise everything. I will, I will not make decisions that are not data-based or that are not based on technical solutions. I do not make decisions based on my gut feelings. I just accompany myself with the best of the best in my team, Juan Pardiñas, Ildefonso are um, with me. And, but, but there are many more people. Enrique de la Madrid, who is my main advisor for the economic uh, platform, uh, together with many other experts, and we will make very well-founded decisions.
Good morning, and thank you for that wonderful presentation. I wanted to ask you about innovation in Mexico. Mexico invents 0.3% of its GDP in research and development, and that is low even for Latin America in terms of, and even lower for the OECD countries. The government uh, has weakened CONACYT, sustainability issues will not be resolved without innovation. What do you think about how to promote innovation in education and also in terms of private companies' demands for well, innovation? I am going to contrast my position with, the, uh, with that of my opponent. You know, like when they were going to take away the uh, grants from Conacyt. I, I literally lay myself on the street. And that picture was very famous because I was completely opposed to uh, overriding the trust fund that allowed us to have uh, or, uh, to, or to give grants to students to go and study abroad. And the opponent, the, the, the other candidate, who's supposed to be a scientist, did not defend her fellow scientists. So when the decision was made, we, the scientists, uh, had completely different positions, the engineer and the scientist. I, as an engineer, I am a fan of engineering and I'm a fan of technology, of innovation. I think that the, the effects of, of climate change can revert, can be reverted with technology there, there was like a, a proposal that they, they they featured in the New York Times of how to display like a huge umbrella to protect the earth from the sun uh, from sun um, rays and th th that's very primary but it can be done. I think that what is key is that we spend money uh, in the right places that money doesn't go to waste. We have spent. $50 billion in Pemex. Just imagine what $50 billion spent in, in environmental improvements, education, healthcare could have done. But this government is obsessed with looking into the past and this is why they are splurging resources where they are go to no good use. Pemex can go into hydrogen, into geothermal energy, into carbon sequestration. So Pemex can become profitable if we invest the resources in innovation. I want I to apologize. Thank we you. have no more time. <laughs> speaker for today, the candidate for the presidency of the Republic of Mexico. We wish you every success. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.